Do you remember the time when Ubisoft was not a pile of steam and garbage capable of only doing the same game over and over? Back in 2000s, the company was responsible for publishing a lot of highly popular video games that are now considered to be classics of their era and never being made again because selling Assassin's Creed over and over is simply more profitable. And back in 2005, Ubisoft decided to chase the money attracted by survival horror genre and publish its own Resident Evil game. It hired the independent developer Darkworks, which has just tasted a little bit of commercial success with Alone in the Dark and said its goal to compete with Resident Evil by releasing Cold Fear on March 2005. I mean, it's definitely a good decision to release a survival horror game three months after the Resident Evil 4 release, and with Resident 4 being remade today to a good-looking and better-playing action horror game, Cold Fear remains to be this. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alex B and this is Retrospective, a series where I play the old games in their entirety to answer the question, do they hold up by the modern standards? Leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content like this. Today, we are traveling to the dark and cold waters of the Barren Sea to investigate the distress signal that's coming from a whaling ship that randomly appeared on the radars of the US Coast Guard. First things first. If you want to play this on a modern machine, you gotta modify the game to make it run properly because for some reason it cannot recover itself after switching to any other window. And even if you try your best and not switch to anything during the game, it may do it for you instead and make the game even more horrifying. But once it works, we start with Tom Hansen, a member of the US Coast Guard, who is sent to investigate a distress signal from the Eastern Spirit, a Russian whaling ship. The USS Ravenswood. We arrived in the vicinity of the vessel and will now initiate a search patrol and look for it. Ravenswood out. In simple words, it's Leon Kennedy from AliExpress, but let's see how the official manual describes Tom. Once a hero, now disgraced, Hansen is happy to fade into the woodwork as just one more guy out there saving lives with a Coast Guard. All the changes when his vessel receives an order to rescue a whaling ship during a raging storm. What he finds there will reawaken the dying embers of his spirit, if it doesn't kill him first. Pretty traditional for 2005, right? But here is what the same manual tells about the story of the game. Tom Hansen is just another guy in the US Coast Guard when his crew receives a mysterious order to undertake a hazardous rescue mission in the teeth of a winter storm. As the waves surge higher, Tom and his crewmates find the vessel, an abandoned Russian whaling ship. They board it and discover that the ship was only being abandoned by the human life. That's a lie, by the way. Something else is on board, something deadly. And soon Hansen is the only one left who can stop it. Joining forces with the only other survivor, Hansen must battle the inhuman menace and seek out its very heart for a confrontation that could have consequences for all of humanity. So, Hansen is just another guy who was once a hero and now is disgraced but for some reason accepted for service at the Coast Guard. Okay, luckily, none of the character traits actually make any difference. We'll be discussing the characters and the story of Cold Fear along the way. For now, let me say that the overall atmosphere in Cold Fear is just spot on. The graphics are obviously aged, but they look pretty fine too, with realistic lighting and textures that really help sell the feeling of being stranded in the middle of nowhere. It was the time few years before the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 ushered the new era of console gaming with high-definition graphics. So, for its time, Cold Fear's graphics were more than decent. The game was developed using the RenderWare engine, which was quite popular among the wide range of PS2 titles. The engine allowed for dynamic lighting and shadows, which gave the game a more realistic and immersive feel. The game's environments are well detailed with rusty pipes, flickering lights and other elements that make the abandoned ship feel like a real place. The character models are also pretty detailed, though sometimes the design of the characters, especially the Russian mercenaries, leave a lot to be desired. For example, while Tom Hanks Tom Hansen was supposed to look like a Coast Guard, but cosplays Marty McFly for some reason, and it's rather acceptable. The colonel in the shed looks like this. Stravutia, speak English. 
It doesn't matter now. I mean, the designers could have researched that the officers wear the parade uniform not on board, and for some reason it's an infantry officer on a valent ship. But on a parade. Nonetheless, one thing that stands out about Gold Fury's graphics is the use of weather effects. The game takes place in the middle of a snowstorm, and the snow and wind effects really sell the feeling of being stranded on a ship in the middle of the barren sea. The waves also look great, with realistic water effects that make the ocean feel dangerous and unpredictable. Overall, while Cold Fear's graphics may not hold up to modern standards, they were definitely impressive for their time, I think so. The game's use of dynamic lighting, detailed environment and weather effects helped create an immersive and memorable experience. The sound also contributes to the whole immersive aspect of the game a lot. The ship at the starting level creaks and grows with every step, the wind howls, the waves clash against the hull, it's eerie, but in a good way. The inside sections of the ship sound almost quiet, which creates a lot of suspense that is being released only during the combat encounters, especially when they are against the local monsters, the Ganado, the Exos, the former humanoids infected by exocells, the organisms of unknown nature. The music is also one of the better features of Cold Fear. When attacked by Exos, you get a chaotic loop of industrial electronic music to create an additional sense of tension. The quieter exploration parts are often accompanied by detuned synthesizer keys, creating a soundscape making even the peaceful segments a lot more tense. However, most often, the game offers you just a plethora of greatly designed natural sounds from outside whistling of the winds at the stormy sea to the fire alarm that sounds too naturalistic sometimes. At the same time, the voices and the voice acting overall it definitely balances my impressions of the sound. The Russian mercenaries speak like this. You failed your exam. Come back next year. I perfectly understand that in 2005 it was quite hard to hire a native speaker to do voice acting, but the other games simply used the English voice actors with heavy Eastern European accent. But Cold Fear decided to be clever and as a result looks kinda funny for everyone who knows at least a bit of Russian language. What is even funnier, the characters like Anna Kamsky and her father Dr. Viktor Kamsky are supposed to be Russian as well, but their voice actors are English speakers. What is even funnier, by the end of the game, the same Russian mercenaries forget their language and start speaking English. Maybe they have become aware that Hansen kills everyone with bad accent. The gameplay of Cold Fear is rather interesting. Initially, it tries its best, being the survival horror game similar to Resident Evil games. It features the same third-person perspective with the behind-the-back camera when aiming the weapon. It has similar movement controls and it has similar approach to exploration when you can access certain parts of the game after completing required actions. However, Resident Evil does not make the quest items appear and disappear depending on the story progression. So, it is crucial to follow the objectives of the mission, otherwise you simply become stuck and don't know what to do. Additionally, there is no map. The game features two major zones during the campaign, the whaling ship and the oil rig. Similar industrial navy looks, no stylization. Both zones try to be as realistic as possible, as even the signs indicating the rooms are named in Russian. Luckily, Hansen knows the language and the translation pops up every time you check the signs, so you have to remember them as you progress, because you'll be doing a lot of backtracking, especially at the oil rig. Further, there are no automatic saving. The save points are given solely by the game every time you finish an objective, so if you die during the first hour of the gameplay, you'll start the whole game again. 
If you run too far from the objective and get killed before saving, you will lose your progress. And I cannot understand the reason why would anyone consider this a fair mechanic. So, as you can already see, it's not Resident Evil, it's mostly an action-adventure with hollow elements. But at the same time, the gunplay is definitely satisfying and rather fair, especially when played with mouse and keyboard. One unique aspect of Call of Fear's controls is the way the game handles camera movement. Rather than using a fixed camera, the game features a dynamic camera that moves and shifts depending on the player's position. While it's true that in some moments it creates more cinematic experience, at the other moments it creates a feeling of disorientation and making it difficult to keep track of enemies and objects and your own position. For this specific reason, I completed the whole game mostly from the aim perspective as it was rather fluid for exploration and effective during the combat encounters. Combat in Cold Fear is a mix of third-person shooting and melee combat. Tom Hansen, the game's protagonist, has a variety of weapons at his disposal, including pistols, shotguns and assault rifles. In addition to the firearms, Tom can also use melee attacks, such as kicks and punches, to take down enemies, but only in separate conditions. This is especially helpful when you need to do quick-time events perfectly to kill tougher enemies at the later stages of the game. It features a variety of enemies, most of which can be dealt with a carefully aimed headshot. The Stetson pistol works perfectly fine for the majority of the bipedal enemies. The flamethrower can be effectively used against the nests of exocells. The AK rifle can be used against the exomasses, while the exoshades can be dealt with shotguns and QTEs. The gun selection is simple, and it is a good thing. The only difference from standard pistol rifle shotgun loadout is the inclusion of the spear gun aimed to distract the infected. A good idea, especially when you are outnumbered and don't have enough ammo. The story of Cold Fear references a lot of cliché action and horror films. We have determined that we start on a Russian whaling ship, and we set out to explore it and investigate what is happening. We kill two mercenaries for a poor accent, face the thickness of Hansen, hear the screams from nearby room asking us to free them, and next we proceed to kill more Russians for their bad voice acting. We explore the game from a lot of notes, offering us hints about the best events and advices on how to fight certain enemies. A nice touch, making reading the notes actually useful. Eventually, we find our team's Captain Lansen in a predicament and figure out that the ship is being overrun by the Exocell infestation, an unknown sentient organism discovered on a secret oil rig with an ability to possess dead bodies and even cause further mutation into fearsome monsters. The responsible for this operation are the Colonel Yusupov and his head of security, Major Anishinko. Following the task of organized criminal organization, Yusupov hires Dr. Kamsky to research the exocell and develop the antidote against the infection. Kamsky succeeds to an extent that he injects the exocell to his body in search of becoming an immortal being. We find that out from Yusupov himself when he lays dying in one of the ship's rooms. He also tells us about Anna, the daughter of Dr. Kamsky, who was locked up on a ship to manipulate the doctor to stop his atrocities with the exocells. We return to the starting room, release Anna, listen to her wonderful ideas and then go to the radio room to contact her father. But instead we get the response from his assistant Bakharev. We get to the crow's nest while fighting the infected and then… You sure you wanna do this? It's our only chance! How did I know you were gonna say that? Now! We eventually get to Bakhariev, he treats us from the infection and suddenly you need to ah! dies. Nobody moves, there's blood on the floor. Our task on the oil rig is to disable the radio jammer so that the CIA can locate us and evacuate from this mess. To get to the security room, we need the Anishinko's eye, so we get it the hard way. Nobody moves, there's blood on the floor. 
We returned and received a message from the CIA that we need to send an XSL research from the laptop of Kamsky. Additionally, we got to cure Anna of the infection because she becomes important to us for some reason. Because before that we are being infected once again, and instead of curing us, we cure some random woman that we meet a couple of hours before. I guess Hansen decided to stop being disgraced and die a hero. We do exactly that, but instead of sending the CIA the whole research, we just send the data on the antidote and then decide to destroy the whole rig. We plant the sea for us and we are ready to escape. But before that, we have to fight mutated Kamsky. It is an awesome setup, and I expect a fight like an older Resident Evils, when you need to destroy Nemesis with just hopes and prayers. But instead, just a couple of shots in the back, a couple of QTEs, and that's it. An infected Hansen leaves the rig with Anna and Cold Fear decided to roll credits at that point. So, overall, it's a decent product of its time. It's definitely not a timeless classic as the voice acting can be absurdly funny, the absence of adequate saving and no map make the game a lot more sluggish than it should have been, and the absence of its own identity makes it a bit generic to play in 2023. On the contrary, the beginning levels at the ship are exceptionally atmospheric and immersive. The combat is simple and satisfying, and the horror elements are not cheap jump scares, which is already a plus. If somebody would attempt to remake this game with a lot of improvements and overhauls, it might become a solid competitor to Resident Evil 4. The original, not the remake, of course. And that's it for today, thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click a like, and if you're here for the first time, consider subscribing to the channel. Share your thoughts and impressions down in the comments below, and let me know what game should I review in the retrospective series. As for now, I thank you all for watching once again, my name is Alex B, and I'll see you in the next one.